Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Fegan. I have my guitar pick earrings on, so you know what time it is. It's time to talk about my favorite albums that came out in the year 2021. I think 2021 was an amazing year for music overall. Um, there are fewer things that I feel like are gonna like stick with me as forever favorites from this year, but I had more stuff that I liked than I had in 2020. So I'm mostly gonna be talking about my top 10 in this video, but I did wanna round out my top 20 for you for a few reasons. One, just again, because there were a lot of albums from this year that I thought were quite good. So I figured I should mention just, you know, like more than just 10 albums, but also because a lot of the stuff in my top 10 is just like genres that I really love and lean to done well. Um, obviously I'm just like one reviewer. This cannot be an objective list because I'm a subjective uh, appreciator and listener to music. Um, but I feel like some of the stuff in my like number 11 to 20 is a bit broader. Um, so I want to give a shout out to some of those albums that like were amazing, but maybe just not personal favorites because they weren't like, I don't know, the ultimate genres that speak to me or whatever. Just like, you get what I mean. So coming in at number 20, we have I Lie Here Buried With My Rings and My Dresses by Backwash, which upon a re-listen just like completely blew me away. Um, then we have Call Me If You Get Lost by Tyler the Creator. Um, next we have Black Metal 2 by Dean Blunt. Um, Dean Blunt is just very cool, and this also kind of took me by surprise because it, it, the first black metal took me a while to get around to, but this kind of immediately hit for me. At number 17, we have Engine of Hell by Emma Ruth Rundle. At number 16, we have A Color of the Sky by Lightning Bug, kind of underrated. I don't see a lot of people talking about it, but very, very cozy. Um, then we have Bright Green Field by Squid, which I didn't love on a first listen, but really appreciated a lot more on a second listen. Um, then number 14, we have Sometimes I Might Be Introvert by Little Sims, which is my favorite hip hop release of the year. Um, and just like getting a lot of acclaim for very good reason. At number 13, we have A Beginner's Mind by Sufjan Stevens and Angelo de Augustine. Um, probably Sufjan's best release since, I guess, the Mystery of Love EP. Um, then at number 12, we have A Tiny House in Secret Speeches Polar Equals by Sweet Trip, which is my second favorite Sweet Trip album. I am a you will never know why, that's what it's called. I'm a you will never know why truther, but this was really good. And then at number 11, we have Shade by Grouper, which almost cracked the top 10, but upon a re-listen, I realized that there are songs that I love, but overall, it's just like not one of my favorite albums of the year. I mean, it's at number 11, but it's just not like top 10 worthy. And that brings us to our top 10. And at number 10, we have an album that might be objectively not as good as some of the ones I've just mentioned, but is very personal to me and one that I was very highly anticipating and that I really loved, and that is Little Oblivions by Julian Baker. This is the third record from singer-songwriter, indie folk, indie rock artist Julian Baker. For context, her first album, Sprained Angle, is my favorite album of all time, so she is just an artist that I've got my eye on, and I personally think this is her second best album. Her first one was very stripped down and raw, and then her second one was very deeply melancholic and piano and ballad heavy. In this third one, you see her take a more full band approach with a drum set and guitars, and it's just like a much fuller sound than she has explored previously. It's less crescendo heavy than a lot of her other music, and it's really more like standard indie rock, if you will. Um, she doesn't go for like those really, really high notes that I feel like have defined a lot of her other music, um, but it's still quite dark in the way that a lot of her other music was. This album specifically is lyrically dealing with her continued journey of sobriety, um, and especially given the fact that like she's often said she was sober but wasn't actually sober, and just as all of her music has done, this really reckons with being a person and thinking you're a bad person, but like I think especially on this album, not letting herself define herself as a bad person because there's no utility in that for herself or th for the people that she loves. I think so many people make excellent music about mental health, but to me her music has just always spoken the most to me in her lyricism and her storytelling, and I think that that is what comes through so clearly on this album. Um, my favorite tracks are Relative Fiction and Hardline, and then the one piano ballad on the album, Song in E, um, it just like the lyrics that really touched me. There's actually a live version of that song, it used to be called Mercy, where she's playing it on guitar, and that I might even like better than the album version. So if you enjoyed that song, like just search Julian Baker Mercy Live, and there should be a video of it, and it's incredible. Um, and so yeah, if you've liked any of Julian Baker's work previously, I do think this is definitely work che worth checking out. At number nine, we have probably the heaviest album of the year, and that is Sinner Get Ready by Lingua Ignota. This is a neoclassical, darkwave, avant-folk album that is 
very difficult and very rewarding to listen to. This is a harrowing, deep, and kind of haunting album that in some ways is kind of sparse. Um, you have some of these, again, like, I'm gonna call them ballads, but they're not simple. You have, like, either a deep, discordant piano or organ with her voice layered on top, and it feels almost like you're in a dark cathedral, which is very intentional because a lot of this album does deal with um, Christianity and with religion, but there's also this massive reckoning with trauma and getting over trauma and, and the anger you allow yourself to feel after experiencing trauma. She recently released a very lengthy statement um, about her history of abuse from the frontman of Daughters that I feel like puts this album in a completely different context because we're given the context for these songs. So A, if you listen to this album, I think be aware that it's very, very heavy and B, that statement itself, incredibly heavy. Um, really, really harrowing, um, and please only read that if you feel completely up to it because it kind of ruined my day. But sonically, the way this mixes, that use of like the dark ballad, um, and certain more folk, avant folk inspired songs come together just for this very, very, the word I would use is intense. Um, experience. One that I feel like will carry with me, and again, this is not an album that I could see myself re-listening to that often because it's very difficult, um, but it is so singular, and she again is an artist that I'm just like so excited to watch her career because everything she's done pretty much has been awesome so far. At number eight we have the feel-good album of the year, and that is Nurture by Porter Robinson. And there is something I believe very very strongly about this album, and I think it will tell you everything about whether you're going to enjoy it or not enjoy it, and that this kind of to me feels like Owl City for adults. This is an electropop synth pop album um, that just feels so good, and the reason I feel like even just a little bit kind, I know there's a little bit of joke obviously with that comparison, but I was an Owl City kid. I I loved that feel good like electronic vibe that music gave off but like I don't love it anymore but this I feel like taps into that same kind of feeling but just like more well done. This album is 14 songs long and it's an hour long and it kind of mixes these very life-affirming electro-pop songs that are, you know, like, you, you listen to one and it's very catchy, along with these more nature-inspired interludes um, that are both electronic and very of the world. Um, they feel calming and naturey and as green as the album cover. Musician from this album is one of my favorite songs of the entire year. It's stuck in my head right now as I'm filming this, even when I was talking about the other album, so like it really is like stuck in your head type sugary sweet, very perfect for spring type music. Um, in fact, I'm probably gonna break this out once the world starts getting green again. Um, so if you're looking for some feel-good electropop, glitchy, happy music, this is what I would recommend. So there are actually two EPs on this list. Um, I figure like EP album, I might as well just do it all together. So at number seven, we have The Asymptotical World by Eve's Tumor. You all have complete permission to clown on me in the comments if I've just pronounced that incorrectly, but this is a noise pop neo-psychedelia EP by black non-binary icon Eve's Tumor. They are like maybe, I'm, I've said this now for like every fucking artist, um, they're just like one of the most interesting artists currently making music to me. Honestly, if I had to give a top three, I've got Big Thief, Alex G, and Eve's Tumor are the three people that like when they put something out, like I'm gonna go listen to it immediately. So I've always really loved Eve's Tumor stuff for the way that their music feels kind of like a menagerie of genres, and this EP is no different. You have Jackie, which is this kind of like psychedelic inspired alt rock song. This actually might be my song of the year. It is just like so deliciously sensual and psychedelic and rock and just like I've worked out to it. I've like danced around to it in my house. It is just like a perfect, perfect rock psych song. Then you go to a song like Crushed Velvet, which is just a psychedelic but really leans into that pop element. It's a little bit warmer. Um, it's just, you know, it's a little less heavy but still in that same vein. And then along with those two very catchy songs, you kind of delve into more electronic, glitchy, less catchy but just as like um, ear-catching music, stuff that really keeps you, it's, it's not as hooky, but it's just as dynamic, if you will. This whole thing is just a mixture of electronic, dancey, punky sounds, um, and it's just a perfect little EP. Eve's Tumor is awesome, um, and if you're looking for just kind of like a punch of musical 
brilliant mosaic. Um, this one was awesome. At number six, we have my other EP on this list, and that is Pushing Daisies by Julie, which I think might be the least well-known release of this whole list. This is a 12-minute long shoegaze EP. Um, it is six songs, but two of those songs I think are like left fewer than 20 seconds. They're really completely meaningless little interludes, but the other four songs are just like some of the best shoegaze I've heard in a while. I feel like shoegaze is kind of on the lighter or dreamier side or the noisier side, and this is definitely noisier. It feels kind of in the spirit of My Bloody Valentine, um, and I feel like some of the best tracks feel like they could have been like they don't feel like they could have been loveless offshoots, but it's definitely more in that vein than something that's like light or dreamy. It also has a massive grunge influence. There's a song, um, Loch Ness, which seems to be like the, the favorite of the EP that almost has like a Riot girl esque vocal performance, which I find really cool. Um, Daisy Pusher is one of the only male fronted songs. I don't really, I don't know who Julie is. To be honest with you, I have no idea who group artist Julie is. Some of the songs in the CP are female fronted, some are male fronted. Um, I really don't know any biographical information. I just know that it sounds fucking awesome, but Daisy Pusher is th this male fronted, just like really angsty, rocky, shoegaze song. It's fucking awesome. I think my personal favorite on this EP is April's Bloom, which is a little bit more of like a traditional shoegaze song, but the fact that I've just mentioned three of the four, and I have all four of the actual songs liked on Spotify, um, should be telling for you. It's just, if you like shoegaze, um, this is really just like, it's really just the genre well done. I think that's kind of what I was talking about, how like, some of the albums I have from like numbers 11 to 20 are doing more, they're a little bit more innovative, they're more interesting, um, exciting releases from the year, but for me personally, shoegaze is just my favorite genre. So this EP just did something I love incredibly well. Something that is very innovative and is doing something totally new is Volcanic Bird Enemy and the Voice Concern by Lil Ugly Mane at number five. So Lil Ugly Mane is an artist that got started in kind of like the experimental hip-hop scene. Um, I remember listening to, what is it called, Undoing an Evil Deed Blues, which kind of blew my mind. He also has another really, really long, I know he has two long experimental hip-hop songs, and that's the one that I liked better, so that's kind of what I always associated him with. But this album is this neo-psychedelia, hypnagogic pop album that is, again, um, kind of like a mosaic of genres, totally different to the Eve's Tumor, but like, also just like blending a lot of stuff and putting it all in one release. This takes cues from hypnagogic pop and trip hop and even dream pop, and each song kind of sounds a little bit different, but it all feels like it's under the same, and I don't mean this in a cheap way, like under the same fuzzy, melty filter. I like the way I wrote about this. The sentence I wrote was, another album that feels like a mosaic. From shoegaze to Dixieland to trip hop, this feels like a lot of disparate but similar tunes under the same psychedelic wash dripping fuzzy filter um and I think that's what I love about this album this is maybe the album on this list that I have the most like liked songs on Spotify just because he's doing so many things and not every song is a hit for me I think that's kind of the risk you run with an album like this is that like there were some duds but the ones that did hit for me hit hard my personal favorite just because this totally speaks to my sensibilities with styrofoam which is just kind of like this Dixieland song, but it's completely fuzzed up with glitchy little elements. I mean, I'm a bitch who loves The Caretaker, of course that song is going to speak to me. I just think the way he plays with sampling and genres in this album is so smart, and it is so exciting to see this new direction, but, and, and like, it, it's both new, but also makes sense from where he's come from. You can see, I feel like, some of these influences even in his hip-hop stuff, um, so just a really unexpected, exciting album, one I would check out if you were interested in literally any of like the 10 genres that I have um, talked about here. So I re-listened to my entire top like 40 in order to make this list, and some things um, rose really high in the ranks, and some things um, got lower. Those are the words I'm looking for. And this used to be my number one, um, but upon listening to it, there were just, this didn't get worse, but there were three others that I liked more, and that is To See the Next Part of the Dream by Paranol. This is a shoegaze emo record that is incredibly enigmatic because no one knows who Paranol is. He is a Korean musician, um, but he has not revealed his identity, and even in interviews he's been like, I'm just an average guy. I don't really want people who know me to know that I make music. We think he's a, they, I don't even think, I don't even think their gender is known, so my apologies for using that pronoun, but um, 
they're, I think, just a student. Just a college student making music in their room. I think part of the reason I like this album, in theory, is the allure of, like, how was this made? We don't know. That's exciting. But outside of the allure of, like, how this album was made, I think the reason this works so well is it has the emotions and the rawness of emo music. It's just using the formula of the shoegaze sound. I saw someone describe this as, what, like an emo record in a dream, and it really does feel like that. Um, this is hazy and kind of like constant wall of sound, but it's not as rock or grungy as the Julie stuff. Um, it, it is kind of, kind of dreamy at times, even though it's not light, it does feel very, um, airy and, and, yeah, just kind of, I don't know, for some reason the, 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 the word I want to use is constant. There's always constant sound happening, but it's never quite too harsh. I think the vocal performance is also so incredibly evocative, even if you don't know what he's singing immediately, because he's singing in Korean, so the lyrics aren't there presently, but you look them up and they're full of all of this angst. Um, and I feel like that just completely comes through in both the music and just the vocal performance. I know Paranol was also involved in a collaboration EP this year, um, or last year I guess, that I was not able to check out, but um, they are just an artist I want to keep following, because what's going on there? I want to know. I don't know. And this is, yeah, this is just a very, very unique shoegaze album because of how much it draws from like that emo tradition. Very cool. At number three, the best pop album of the world, nope, of the year, is Mercurial World by Magdalena Bay, which, holy shit, on a re-listen, like just completely rocked my world. This is the synth pop album of the year. Um, I think Magdalena Bay is a synth pop duo who are dating. Um, the woman is the lead vocalist, but like when I was just like Googling them, I was like, ah, there's these two guys. I think when you like Google Magdalena Bay, the first question is like, are they dating? So that's all the biographical information I have for you. Um, but this album just feels Perfect. It's everything I want from a synth pop album. The vocal performance feels like it's one step away from you through a film of like shimmer. It is so warm and almost twee, not in terms of the actual melodies, but in terms of like the tone of her voice. It like, it's just not quite sugary sweet, but like, I think I saw someone describe this album as what? Like a, like a morphine drip. Yeah. The songs feel like they're dripping and like they're like full of sucrose or, 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 or not a, or, or, um, not, what's that fucking syrup song called? Not cough syrup. It just took me like a minute to remember the fucking phrase corn syrup, but even that doesn't feel like an accurate description because who wants to drink corn syrup? Um, it just feels so drippy and lush and incredible. It's hazy, it drips, it's lush, it has elements of noisier pop and electro pop and also has elements of house music. My favorite song in this is a song called Sherry, which I think I've listened to, I don't know, like 12 times in the last like three days, um, which is a lot for me. I don't usually spam songs like that. I, I don't know, it usually takes me a while to get to a lot of plays on a song because of how much music I listen to, but like that has these house elements. It really feels like it's just like, enveloping you in this world. Meanwhile, you have songs like Mercurial World and You Lose that are just like synth pop bangers. They just do everything from that genre, right? And then my other favorite song on this album is Hysterical Us, which um, has a dance pop element, but also really brilliantly incorporates some sophisti pop elements, just like both in like the overall vibe of the song and like the use of saxophones. Um, and it just feels a little bit more sophisticated. And yeah, it just like all comes together. Um, to, 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 into like this perfect product. I feel like if you gave me more time, this could even end up at number one or number two on this list. Um, but again, just like one and two right now, I'm a little bit more inclined towards. But um, if you need something dancey, sugary, synthy, this is the album I would recommend to you. Then at number two, we have another album that completely jumped up. Um, this I used to have as like a 3.5 out of 5 in my brain and now it's number two of the year. It's a 4.5 and that is an overview on Phenomenal Nature by Cassandra Jenkins, which just just completely blew me away when I re-listened to it. This is the most personal album I've heard all year, both I think in terms of its lyrical content and also personal to me. So this is a singer-songwriter album by Cassandra Jenkins, who um, was set to go on tour with Purple Mountains um, in 2019, before David Berman killed himself. 
Um, so there is a good deal of this album that deals with that grief. Um, and so those songs do a lot of s storytelling, but even the ones that aren't about him just like reveal that like she has such a command of lyrics and of poetry. Um, and even I think, yeah, if I read some of these songs, not as songs, but as poems, I'd be moved. The lyrics hit so hard because of their specificity. I think a lot of like, I don't know, popular music, not to be a contrarian, um, is general to relate to the most people. But the reason these hit is because they are personal stories. They're specific, there are details. Um, but then along with that, the music is just lush and breezy. There's this one song on the album called New Bikini that has the lyric, um, baby, go get in the ocean if you're breezed or scraped or any kind of broken the water, it cures everything. Um, and I feel like that's fitting because this, uh, this album at times feels kind of like the quiet rush of like a calm sea. It's just very breezy. It's one of those albums where I think the album cover perfectly encapsulates how it feels. Um, and I love, again, how this leans into certain genres at different times. It leans into kind of sophisty pop um, and spoken word elements and the most popular song on the album, Hard Drive. Then it also has way more folk um, inspirations and songs like Crosshairs. My two, my three personal favorites actually are just kind of like not traditional singer-songwriter, but um, we have Ambiguous Norway, which is very much about David Berman, and New Bikini, and Michelangelo. Um, and it's all just stunning. I really would recommend this album to fans of Phoebe Bridgers. I'm not as much of a Phoebe fan as I used to be, and I feel like this kind of does the thing she's going for a little bit better. Um, but even if you do like Phoebe, I just feel like this album would really speak to you, because in ways I feel like they're going for, at times, similar... Um, similar atmospheres, especially Stranger in the Alps. I, I get a similar kind of breeziness and storytelling atmosphere um, from both of those records. And then we have my number one album, which I feel like is completely fitting because back in February, March, or April, there was a song by this artist that I could not stop listening to, and no one really knew who she was. She was just kind of this contemporary folk artist that, you know, like some people knew about her, but she hadn't had an album in a while that people were excited about, so I was just like listening to my Little song on my own, but at number one we have The Path of the Clouds by Marissa Nadler. The song I was obsessed with for, for Curious Minds was called Yellow Lights. Still maybe my favorite song of hers, but this album is by far the best thing from her I've ever heard. This is another singer-songwriter album, but it has really, really strong elements of dream pop and psychedelic folk and Americana and it's very, very gothic, both in terms of how it sounds and also in terms of its lyrical content. Whereas I feel like Cassandra Jenkins's album was a little bit more stripped back, I feel like this accomplishes what is what it accomplishes through the use of instruments. Um, certain songs feel very, oh god, I was gonna say slidey. Um, my favorite song in the album is called "If I Could If I Could Breathe Underwater." Tell me I'm right. Yeah, if I could breathe underwater, and like that hits with kind of like this dripping, haunting guitar and beat. Um, and I feel like that also fits again with the lyrical content, which is very much inspired by true crime. This album in some ways has a very antique feeling to it. Um, the lyrics are very much in the spirit of like older country songs that were about like a woman scorned or just like, you know, someone who has committed a crime. It's also doing a lot of storytelling, but I feel like it uses the music to amplify that really well. These songs are haunting and personal, even if they're not all exactly personal to Marissa, which I'm not totally sure if any of them are autobiographical. Um, one of my other favorite songs on the album is Bessie Did You Make It, um, which again kind of sounds like an improved Lana Del Rey song, who is another artist who I have liked things from but I'm not totally enamored of. Um, but that just like has that very haunting, lush atmosphere and that wh the whole album does. It just feels, what did I say, sultry, dark, gothic, washes over you, stunning. It's an album that I want to live inside. I think it really shows how much collaboration went into this album. A lot of the songs have people from other genres collaborating on it, so it has this ultimate um, grounding in folk and singer-songwriter, but all these other genres of, again, like gothic rock or Americana or just like more traditional folk or country really speak out and come through in each of these individual songs. It's just like one of the most beautiful, haunting, albums I've ever heard and easily my favorite of the year. So those are my top 20 and top 10 albums and EPs of 2021. 
Let me know what your favorites of the year were, if I've missed any um, that you loved. Maybe I've heard them, but maybe I haven't heard them and there's some stuff that I just completely missed and have to check out. Um, and let me know what you think of any of the albums I've mentioned here, whether you've already heard them, and especially if you check them out. I love knowing that people actually <laughs> go to check things out that I've mentioned, so that would just make my heart very, very warm. Here's to hopefully more amazing music coming out in the year 2022. Um, but that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and you will see me in the next one. Corn sugar? Corn syrup? Corn syrup? Oh my God, corn syrup? Yeah!